Uh, my name is Chris Long, uh, and this is our talk on how we use GitHub for automated case management. Um, and the kind of subtext for this uh, talk is making the most of the tools you already have. Um, it was awesome seeing Brex's presentation because my talk is actually going to uh, touch on and like reiterate some of the points that they brought up as well. Um, so I think this will blend really well together, but I think there are some um, things that we're doing a little bit differently, and it's great to have this variety of uh, different like methodology. So a bit of background about myself. Um, I'm the director of security over at Material. Uh, I am the creator of an open source project called Detection Lab, and my background is like heavily in incident response and detection engineering. Um, to put this talk into a little bit of context, Material Security, um, we're under 60 employees, uh, and we have three full-time security staff members, and that includes myself. So our security team is uh, extremely lean and mean. Um, so. Um, this kind of helps frame how we do detection internally at Material. Uh, just walking through what we'll talk through today, I'll go into a little bit of detail about how we approach detection, um, like our philosophy behind it, how we author detections. Um, talk about how I think about notifications versus like more form formal alerting. And then go into how we use GitHub uh, as a case management tool. And then obviously Tynes is the uh, glue that binds all of that automation together. And then I'll just walk you through some of the challenges that we faced um, building this and, and the conclusion and kind of forward looking things from here. So going into our detection methodology, um, the hill that I am pretty much like willing to die on uh, is that data volume is not the same thing as data insight quality. It's great if you have all these security logs and they're all centralized and you have them stored and if you have an incident you can refer to them. That's not the same thing as getting value out of your data and driving down risk in your organization. Take some time to understand what data, like what things does that data enable you to uh, unlock in your organization? What sorts of things can you detect? How would you write those detections based on how that data is formatted? Take some time to actually go through that exercise. Don't be satisfied with the fact that the data exists somewhere in your organization. Um, over my career, I've seen an endless amount of like tooling churn of how people are storing data, how people are querying data, and I don't think that's the most important factor here. I think it's making the most out of what, it, what you have, and I think that's going to be a recurring theme throughout this talk. Um, we adopted Palantir's alerting and detection strategy framework. Uh, if you haven't had time to read this blog post, I highly recommend it. This was a framework that was developed in order to basically solve the alerting spam problem. So I think many orgs get very excited when they're writing new alerts. They don't put a whole lot of thought into what the alert volume is going to be or like what the false positive potential might be. Um, and basically what this framework uh, outlines is a, a huge write-up per detection that's written that explains in detail um, what is the purpose of the detection? How does it actually work? What are some known false positives? Are there blind spots? What are dependencies? Um, if you have to put that much thought into and rigor into building a single detection, that detection quality basically ends up going through the roof. Um, so for us, uh, every one of our detections has a clearly documented purpose, playbook, and validation steps because we follow this framework. Um, I'm not going to go through and read this detection for you word for word, but this is our uh, this is half of our write up for the Octa session hijack uh, detection that we have. So basically, we're looking for a single Octa session. Um, that uh, is reused from uh, both a separate IP address and a separate geolocation. So it would be totally expected that we would see a single Okta session from multiple IP addresses. Maybe somebody went from their house to the coffee shop, two different IP addresses, similar geolocation. Uh, what we wouldn't expect is to see someone within uh, a short amount of time uh, show up in California and then in like Colombia within like an hour or something. Um, this doesn't necessarily even have to be an impossible travel. Um, this, this alert actually goes off quite a bit when we have uh, employees fly to our office for, um, you know, uh, just to visit the office. So, uh, you know, we get those alerts, but it's very clear that they're coming from their home state and coming to California, and we can see that data in the alert. Um, but the idea behind this is that someone who's not familiar with Okta and maybe not even super familiar with, like, session theft should be able to come and read the technical context of this detection and understand like how does it work and like what is it all about and that's what that technical context section is all for so i want to touch on a little bit about how i think about like notifications versus alerting uh, 
early on at Material when I had first joined, our tools were basically configured to alert or notify security people in one of two ways. You had paging, which is like, to me, kind of the nuclear option, or you could have like Slack messages sent to like a, a channel. And to me, this was like the opposite ends of the spectrum. One, you know, is going to wake me up at three in the morning uh, and make me very angry because it was probably not actually a pageable event. And then the other is very ephemeral. I might not see it. Nobody's keeping track of it. Uh, it's just kind of like, not the, the area you want to be in. So I knew we needed to do something better. And that's how we started getting into this um, project, essentially. Uh, I think <laughs> Brex touched, touched on this. Uh, it was maybe a little bit more direct, but I, I will make like a firm stance that like Slack Ops is not case management. Um, I think it's totally fine to send things like notifications uh, to Slack and just, you know, if somebody sees it, that's awesome. You know, something that's not actionable, like, oh, a, a new company-owned device was registered, or like a new hire user account was created. Maybe I don't have to do anything about that. Maybe I just like want to know when it happens. But there's no follow-up action associated with that. Um, but if there is something that's more like, oh, you know, an Okta session was observed logging in from two locations within the past hour, like, I want to follow up on that. I want to know that that is actually safe and like expected behavior. Uh, and I want proof somewhere that I've actually looked into this to show that, yes, like when these things happen that we have said we think are bad because we wrote a detection for it, I need to be able to prove that I'm actually investigating these things. So in my opinion, it's fine to send notifications for these, but I don't think Slack chat history is like a robust source of record. Uh, in my opinion, like most case management like solutions are kind of overkill. Um, and just like talking to people within the industry, like I don't think there's a golden standard for security case management. There's no like one tool that all these different organizations like recommend and people say like, yeah, this is, this is kind of the thing we've settled on using. Um, you see lots of productivity and like task tracking tools used and I, I think that's totally fine. Um, I personally assume anyone's still recommending Jira has Stockholm Syndrome. I'm sorry, Brex, I know you guys use it internally. <laughs> we don't. And if I have to use Jira again, I, I will cry for days. Um, <laughs> but, um, and then, you know, a lot of like uh, SOAR bundled like case management solutions, uh, you know, exist, but they're, they're kind of locked into the vendor and like vendor SOARs are typically very expensive. And we didn't want to go down that route either. Um, I kind of just call this like the, the flight simulator problem, which is like I want a very simple solution. But uh, what I end up with is like feeling like I'm in a cockpit with like 8,000 buttons to push. And like I really only needed like six of those buttons. So uh, that's the description behind that. So uh, I think things are typically framed as like building versus buying. But I really wanted to dig in like, well, can we use tools that we already have to come up with like a really workable solution here? Um, we didn't have the desire to build something custom from scratch, nor do we have like the human resources to do it. Um, buying is going to involve spending more money. Uh, I'm going to have to worry that all of this alert data is in some like separate SaaS product, and you know there's like more sensitive data, and do they have good security, et cetera? Um, I don't want to learn new tools. Uh, this this should be like more simple. Um, you know, a lot of people use the Hive for this. I think it's maybe the most op like popular open source project for it, but also in talking to folks, like nobody had glowing things to say about it. Um, and I didn't want to maintain yet another product as well. So I figured, like, why don't we just look at what we have and use today and see if we can find a good solution there. So I thought, um, if I wanted to store this case data, like, what are the hard requirements involved here? Like, I need uh, the, the content of my alert needs to get stored somewhere. I want to be able to search across my cases. I need to be able to assign it to someone. Uh, it needs like some sort of status is like the case open or close at a, at a minimum. Uh, an API would be absolutely great. Tags, super cool. And I want to be able to leave comments. Like I am triaging this case. I'm telling you what happened in this case. Uh, and what we actually ended up settling on, like kind of surprising even to me, was GitHub issues. So we ended up setting up a completely separate repo specifically to house uh, on like the repo side. Um, there's no code in there, it's just all of our ADSs. So all of those markdown documents that explain how our detections work is the core of the repo and the issues are the actual cases associated uh, with those detections. So if you do come across like a single uh, item here in the issues and you don't really understand the alert, well you just go back to code and then you go look at the, the document that explains it. Um, so this kind of outlines, uh, it meets some of our requirements like immediately. There's a search function, there's a status function, and tags and API. Uh, hopping 
deeper into an actual alert. You know, we have a status, whether things are open or closed. Uh, we have a place to house the alert data in the issue description. And we have the ability to leave comments uh, on the thing, uh, on the issue, and uh, assign it to a person. So really, this kind of checked all of the boxes of the things that I really wanted from a case management tool. Uh, and the best part was it was all free, because we already use GitHub. So uh, jumping into why I like this, um, as I mentioned, it's free, meets all of those requirements I outlined. Uh, I already know how to use GitHub issues. We pretty much trust GitHub. We already have a bunch of sensitive you know, information with them today, so that's fine. Uh, it's pretty flexible. It's, it has no vendor uh, like allegiance or, or lock-in or anything like that. Um, the API, for me at least, has been great. That doesn't, it's not missing anything. Um, on, the, on the shrug side of things, like there's no fancy bells and whistles. Like it's not gonna create fancy timelines for you. It's not gonna do some like metrics dashboarding for you. You can do that on your own. Like the, the dashboards you get out of the box with some of the more expensive stuff is like probably not even relevant metrics to you in the first place. Um, it's not purpose built for security case management. GitHub issues is not a security case management tool, but I think it actually works pretty well for it. Um, the like one limitation I kept bumping into was like I sometimes would have an alert that would go off a few times uh, and I wanted to just like bolt close them but also leave a comment that like the same comment on each one of those cases. So I want to close three cases and say, you know, leave the same comment. Uh, and I, you can't do that natively in the interface, but I wrote like an eight step times workflow that just does that for me. So um, that's solved. So let's talk about how times fits into all of this and makes this possible. Um, like once we had alerting in a really good spot, you know, we have detections built, we're creating alerts, um, we are, our cases are, are stacking up, um, we have a, like a really good triage flow. Um, what we realized is like many, many of these alerts can just be simple uh, or answered by uh, just asking the end user, like, hey, was this you? Like, do you recognize this activity? Um, this entire concept is not new at all. The OG blog post here is maybe Ryan Huber's uh, distributed security alerting uh, that he wrote back at Slack in 2017. Um, we had the idea, like, we'll just use a Slack bot and we'll just reach out to the user. If it's, if it's a detection where this makes sense to just confirm, hey, this sensitive action, was this you? We'll just have the Slack bot handle that for us. Um, I think there's just so much value in doing this. Obviously, finding the right events to do this on is, is the art here. But you literally go from you know, asking if this was somebody, and if they say no, it's potentially like you've detected an incident immediately. And like, how much work have you done here? Like, very little. You just wrote a detection, asked a person if they remember doing something, and they said no. Boom. Like, you've detected an incident. Awesome. Um, and so you know, we wanted to move forward with this. But obviously, when you want to create a Slack bot, like, one of the questions becomes like, well, where do we host this bot? Like, do I do I spin up like a compute instance, or like, am I going to make the serverless? And like, where's the associated code going to live? And like, Tynes just makes this so easy. Like, the answer for us was like, Tynes is going to power this for us. And TK has even written like a nice post on how to do this, like step by step. So uh, say hello to our security bot. Uh, for the folks in the back who can't read it, security bot says, hi, everyone. Material security created me and couldn't even be bothered to give me an original name or even a cool avatar. That's OK, though, because I perform a really important job function. And security bot says, what is my purpose? And we say, you ask people if they remember doing things. <laughs> and he says, oh my god. Uh, but an overview of how this, how basically our alerting flow works is an alert comes into uh, Tynes for us via webhook. Um, and based on that alert data, we check to see if a case, or for us, GitHub issue, has already been created already. And by, uh, we just look at the title, essentially. And I'll get into how this works a bit more in detail later. Um, and if a case already does exist, we just comment on the case once again and say, hey, we, re like, we saw this activity again like pertaining to this case at this time. And you just end up with a timeline of comments of when you keep seeing the same event. Um, after that, we, we do send a link to the case to a security alerts Slack channel. So we do actually have a Slack channel where alerts like pop up. Like We want to know when new alerts come in, but that's not our actual source of record. Um, and then we actually check to see if the given alert that came in is config configured to use Slack bot. Not every single alert can be you know, closed by asking the user if they did something. We have lots of alerts that require a, li a little bit more like manual investigation. Um, but if it does, if it is configured for Slack bot, uh, we DM the user with the details of the alert. Like, hey, do you remember doing this? Yes, this was me, or no, I don't recognize this. Uh, one of the important 
uh, design choices that I made uh, that I think was uh, uh, like smart, basically, was um, we don't send a push notification to the user until they click, this was me, send me a push. I think like the worst experience is an alert comes in, uh, it's configured for Slackbot, and the user gets a push notification before they even see the message from Slackbot. And they're like, what is this push notification for me like out of nowhere? Like this is totally unexpected. This is unexpected behavior, and you've like created this horrible spiral. So instead, once you click, this is me, send me a push, um, the Slackbot will go ahead and send you a push request. Um, and I also thought it would be really important to support retries. So it's totally possible somebody gets it, presses this is me, send me a push, and then they're like, you know, I was gonna go get coffee, I'm gonna go do that, leave my phone on my desk, and the push request times out. Like, then what? So then we have to go like reach out to them and be like, hey, you know, you said it was you, but like your push timed out, and now we have to spend all this manual time. Like, let's just make this workflow retriable. So if it does time out, the little message pops up saying, hey, like, this timed out before you requested it, you can click the button again, and we will retry this challenge. Um, at the end of the day, all we care about is, does the user pass the MFA challenge? It doesn't have to be within some three minute window or something. Um, and if they do, uh, go ahead and accept it. Like, we update the Slack message to say, like, hey, you confirmed this activity. So if you go to your Slack bot or security bot uh, you know, chat history, you see like a history of um, your accepted notifications. Uh, and then on the GitHub issue comment, you know, Slackbot um, times comments and says this was acknowledged by user, um, they passed an MFA check, and so we're automatically closing this for you. Um, obviously, oops, obviously clicking I don't recognize this basically just sets off like all the alarm bells we have available to us. It pings people on Slack on the security team, it pages us, um, it adds a comment saying like this person disavowed this activity, like please start an incident essentially. Uh, to this day, we haven't had one person incorrectly click that. Uh, this is our Times playbook. Uh, this does everything that I just mentioned. I am not going to walk you through this step by step because that would probably take the entire time it would take to get through this talk, but I am happy to share, uh, share it with folks if people are interested. However, I will jump into some specific elements here. Uh, huge credit to John Tuckner for this help. Um, basically, I come up with an idea and I pipe it to Jay Tuckner and he comes back with Tyne's uh, playbook JSON for me. Uh, so uh, I was talking to John about how we really wanted to integrate like Okta MFA pushes uh, into this flow because when we first built it, we didn't have that MFA aspect. Uh, and I swear he came back in like 15 minutes and was just like, here, I did it. Uh, and I plugged it in and it just worked. And I was like, okay, it, yeah, you did do it. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, we needed a little bit of Okta configuration to get this uh, correct source geolocation. So if you don't set this uh, config, basically the Okta push will come uh, show like the geolocation of the server that made the request, which is the Tyne server, which was Ireland. And people were like, what is going on? Like, I am not in Ireland. Uh, we figured that out pretty quickly and, and got that all patched up. Um, however, we're also in the process of moving to like FIDO2 WebAuthn. Uh, so push requests will not be a thing for us in the very near future. So we might need to get like a little bit clever about how we handle uh, MFA in these prompts. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how we handle case grouping and deduplication because this is like kind of a simple yet tricky thing at the same time. Um, I mentioned like if if a if an alert comes in and the case is still open, we basically just add a comment to that existing case saying yes, we saw it again. Uh, for us we're using the alert title as the key to deduplicate on. Um, and what this ends up mean, meaning is you need to be thoughtful about how you construct the title of your alert. So if you have a title that is like a password was changed for a user, well, every user who changes their password, that event is going to get aggregated in that case. So that's one case for many users. Uh, you probably don't want that. Um, but maybe you have user X change their password. So that means it will only aggregate if user X changes their password. If user Y comes and changes their password, it will create a different case. Uh, whereas if you had like user X change their password from you know, IP address Y, uh, it will aggregate on that. And if user X changed their password again, but from a different IP address, it would create a new case. So um, it's, uh, as long as you're thoughtful about how you're creating the title and thinking about aggregation as part of that, then it's, it's pretty straightforward and the Tynes logic is, is really easy here. Uh, one of the other things that was like kind of tricky is um, 
in Tines, like if you use the prompt function, and if you're not familiar and haven't used it before, um, like what we do when you click those buttons, like yes, this was me, or like no, I don't recognize this activity, we're using the prompt uh, function, and that basically uh, routes you to like a Tines website, which is sort of like a callback to the original event that it came from. Um, so what this ends up meaning is like the first time we DM the user on Slack with the details of the alert, uh, that event contains like the Slack message metadata. But after they do the callback, that, uh, that, that event with the metadata is like one behind. But I typically wanna update the Slack message at that point, but I need the metadata from that Slack message. Uh, and so I didn't wanna do this thing where I'm like, ah, oh, just look back like one event, like it seemed a little bit janky. And what I ended up settling on was like, I needed the keep state of that Slack event metadata so that I could update that Slack message. I just started as a GitHub comment in the case. Um, so if at any point in the future, I wanna update the Slack message that we sent to the user, uh, all you need for the API call is the timestamp and the channel of the message. So I just grabbed that from the case comments. Um, it's a little weird to see it in the case comments, but it works really well, honestly. Uh, in closing the loop here, right, like it's not a, not enough for us to just like send these alerts and like just be done with it. Um, sometimes you send, you know, security bot messages people and they don't respond and that's kind of annoying. Like these alerts kind of stay open and I don't want to be hounding people and like chasing them down and being like, hey, security bot like has three open cases for you, like go do your job or whatever. Um, we just have a scheduled uh, event in Tynes that every morning if you have any outstanding notifications, security bot's like, hey, like, scroll back in your chat history and like go acknowledge the events that are still open. And it's obvious because there's the yes, this was me or no, this wasn't me. Um, and then the other thing as well is like um, I mentioned when new cases get created, uh, we add them to a Slack channel. Well, when the case gets closed, let's add a little like check mark emoji. Like it's done, it's done automatically. So I automatically know scrolling through that channel which ones have been closed and which ones are still open. Uh, the story so far. Um, we've been using this workflow for the last nine months. Um, we've triaged over a thousand alerts. Uh, our alerts are 100% compliant, uh, which to us means like somebody has gone in and left a comment, um, you know, like saying that they investigated it and look, looked into it. Um, fun fact, like our bot, if you just try to close a case without leaving a comment, it will reopen it and be like, yo, this is, you can't do this. Like, I'm gonna keep reopening this until you leave a comment. Um, so that kind of helps guarantee that nobody's just going and bolt closing stuff that they don't want to deal with. Uh, and uh, as an added bonus, GitHub issues can't be deleted. So we like when we're showing our auditors like our alerting history in our cases is proof that yes, we do investigate alerts. Uh, there's no like concern that like we're deleting stuff that was like super bad or something like that. Like these are uh, they're not immutable, but they they maintain edit histories. So if you edit the description or comment, the history is there, and you straight up cannot delete them. Um, the, the scary thing there being like, if we ever have an alert explosion of like 5,000 alerts, like they're, they're there forever. So um, our mistakes will be enshrined. But I think auditors like this. Um, talking through some of the challenges uh, we ran into this. So um, there's lots of normalization needed or like expected by this playbook uh, for incoming alerts. So when we're creating the detection um, we actually have to enrich the incoming alert. Uh, it should have the email address uh, associated with the Slack user. Um, we actually will write one custom Slack prompt, which is, hey, what is the bot gonna tell the user about this alert per detection rule that we have? And the nice thing there is it's very customizable. We can say in a very human, uh, non-technical jargon way, like what is happening? What is the activity that we think they just did? Um, and we customize that on a per detection basis. So it's not just like, do you recognize activity like Okta session hijack? People are like, what does that mean? It's like, do you remember being in these two locations in the last 24 hours? Like much more uh, human friendly. Um, we associate, uh, our ID stands for rule ID. Uh, each one of our detections has an associated rule ID. And that's actually how our playbook determines whether or not it's a, uh, should be like a Slack bot uh, alert or just like a regular alert. So we just maintain a list saying like these RIDs are enabled for Slackbot. Um, it also expects a source IP address, a source user. Um, we wanna pass a human readable timestamp. I never wanna ask a user like, do you remember doing this at Unix time, blah, blah, blah? They're like, I don't, I don't know what that means. It's a big number. Um, and as I mentioned, like the titles must 
be written in such a way to be thoughtful about alert deduplication. Um, one thing that I wish I had done at the beginning of this project that I hadn't was um, figuring out a way to test this. What I like started out doing was using our production playbook and like unhooking you know connectors in time so they wouldn't create Slack alerts or cases. I would like forget to re-enable them and like I was just creating a complete mess. Uh, and what I ended up doing was just creating a completely new GitHub issues repo, uh, a completely new Tynes playbook, and just like having basically a staging environment for our Tynes playbook. So I could do testing there without worrying about like totally messing up our data for our like production alerts. Um, the other thing that was a little bit tricky is monitoring failed actions. So uh, the Slack API is like kind of weird in the sense that um, you can have like a bad request and um, sometimes they don't throw an HTTP like 400 you know, range error code. Uh, instead, there's a field inside the response called OK, and it's set to true or false. Um, like Tynes obviously doesn't know that that's a thing that needs to be looked at, and I don't know why anyone would expect that. So what we end up doing is just have triggers on that field, and if OK is ever set to false, um, you know, we set the monitoring flag in Tynes to just like uh, contact us and let us know that something failed. Uh, so yeah, in conclusion, uh, I think my big takeaway here is like make the most of the tools and the data that you already have. Um, try to keep things simple. Like this is not a super complicated workflow. That that Times workbook is you know maybe like a hundred actions, um, but it's been pretty robust and, and pretty solid. Um, honestly, Times just makes things like really easy, really accessible, and sometimes surprisingly fun when you figure out clever ways to do things. I remember taking like so, I don't know some section of like. 12 actions I had and realizing like I could do this with two and like it's just cool to like clean up your graph or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, like use a Slack bot and turn your workforce into a distributed canary deployment. Like why not? Um, it doesn't take a lot and uh, like the gains are huge if you detect an incident from that. Uh, and that's it, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Hand alerts that we would probably send those to like our centralized alerting system and then like enrich the alert at that point um, and then send it to Tynes basically. So, oh, I see what you're saying. For uh, yes, so we do we do still write. Uh, so for example, like one good example is like we we're a GCP customer. We use um, Security Command Center. Like we we ingest those alerts into uh, our our alerting system. Uh, we do still have a, a detection strategy written for that that explains like what is security command center, like what types of events should you be expecting from these and like how would you follow up on them based on that. Um, and sometimes the follow up is uh, if you go to security command center, it tells you how to follow up on each one. Like your vulnerability is like MFA not enabled and it has a whole section of guidance. So I think it's okay to be, to say that in the ADS, which is like if you wanna know how to follow up, like here's the link to the alert and the alert contains the follow up remediation. But uh, yeah, we do still write, uh, you know, we use CrowdStrike as an ADR. Like we have an ADS written for what a CrowdStrike alert is. What, in what context do you send the Octa push notification? Is it for everything? Do you do it for only like the most critical things or like? Yeah, that's a great question. Right now it's for everything. Um, and the reason we do that is um, like we're, we're concerned that if there, if there was a compromise, like the attacker may have also compromised the user's Slack session, right? Um, at first we weren't doing MFA notifications, but that means that an attacker could get into somebody's account, go do a bunch of sketchy things and be like, yeah, this was totally me on Slack because they've owned their Slack session. So adding an MFA step there kind of like avoids that. I think down the road we'll probably get better about prioritizing like our alerts um, and maybe remove the MFA requirement for like certain things. I would say two and a half. Uh, <laughs> yep. Not typically. I would say like the most we would see in a day is like 20. Um, and most of them are like usually pretty clear from the alert details, like uh, if they're like sketchy or not. It's, it's a little bit of overhead, um, but I'm hoping like as we grow the team, like we'll scale this function as well. 16 points total, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry, can you say it one more time? Like somebody closed the door. Yeah, sorry. Um, you were saying that maybe it's just because my stuff Ah, so one thing we did do, uh, we have like some production actions that people will occasionally do like over and over, and we do throttle those. So I will say something like, oh, we'll only send you this message like once every six hours. Even if you like go do the same thing like 20 times, like we'll throttle it for things that people might repeatedly do. So that's. Uh, I haven't had anyone be like, your, your bot is driving me nuts yet. I don't know if people actually think that and just don't want to hurt my feelings, but uh, so far, nobody's been complaining. Uh, that GitHub issue like is the place we would put additional work. Any additional work beyond that, we would probably just deem it an incident at that point. Um, and we would start our incident response process. Yeah, tuning, uh, we would just handle on our own and we would just put that update in the ticket, which is like, oh, you know, added this to the alert whitelist or whatever the case may be. Uh, we just put that notification, like that information goes there. Um, or or on the actual like alert Slack channel itself, like somebody will reply to the thread on that and be like, fixing this alert or something like that or whitelisting this. Um, and then we don't really have too much that, uh, if, if there was something that was like another team was responsible for that was like broken, that was like creating alerts or something, um, we have a separate ticketing system. Like we don't use GitHub issues actually internally for uh, anything really. Um, so we have a separate ticketing system that we use for like kind of development work. Uh, today, we don't do it because I'm probably the person who cares about the reporting and analytics, and uh, I, I can kind of just keep an eye on things. Down the road, I think we'll probably use a Pines workflow, honestly, and, and like structure some GitHub issue queries. You know, we can uh, just hit the API and basically specify a time range of like cases or whatever and go from there. Uh, the other thing I want to start doing as well is using tags for the outcome of the cases. Uh, most of the outcomes are what I would just deem like a trivial true positive, which is like the alert flagged the right activity, but like it's not actually bad. Uh, like the user acknowledged it or whatever. Like it's a true positive, but like we don't care. Yeah, uh, your first question is like, we actually don't lock down our detections and stuff that much and that, that may change like as we grow and have like increasing like insider threat risk and all that stuff. But right now this is all kind of like radically transparent. So this is all uh, actually able to be seen by most people with code access in the organization. Um, so I guess that answers that question, but maybe not in the most secure possible way. Uh, and then the other question, I think is kind of ties into one of the previous questions was like, yeah, if we need to go block something at the infrastructure level, um, what we might do then is open up a ticket on the ticketing system that we use for development side and just reference the GitHub issue because there is like a link to that that they can view due to the sort of openness of all of this. Yeah, we, we could do that. Or we could just, we don't even necessarily have to link the GitHub issue with like the development task. We could just say we have a need to block X, Y, and Z. But if they wanted proof or history or whatever or context, I think it might help to link the GitHub issue. So uh, that's a good question. Are you saying like, uh, so yeah, I don't have the breakdown of like how much we're auto closed by like the user acknowledging them versus someone actually having to go in and like do the check and uh, like manually close it out. Uh, I should definitely pull that metric though because it would be like a pretty easy search. Um, so I don't have that number offhand, but 
if I had to ballpark guess, it's it's at least 50% were auto closed, I imagine. Uh, no, really the GitHub repo is just our, our list of ADS, so it's our documentation for all of our alerting, and uh, then the issues tab is all of the cases like associated with it. Um, yep. So, you just the GCS API right after the name of the CCS or whatever. Oh man, it's weird. They have this weird object thing called like a notification config, I think. And then we send that to our, like our centralized alerting platform, uh, and then like you know uh, enrich it from there. But it's I want to say it's straightforward, but it's really not. Like I think you set up a configure uh, notification config. You tell it what types of things you want it to send. It sends them over pub sub, and then we can like grab them from there. Uh, it's a little weird, but it does work. Uh, I will talk to you about that offline. <laughs> Uh, one more. Ah, yeah. Uh, two things that I am looking at directly. Um, one is that we recently found out that OS Query can record when people are active on their device in terms of typing on the keyboard or using the mouse. Uh, and one thing I'm terrified about is like how much value there is on an endpoint, and I want to know if an endpoint is compromised. And I think like an amazing way to do that is if we see activity coming from an endpoint while the user is not actually active typing or using the mouse. So we're starting to collect that data now. I know it sounds sketchy because it's like, oh, when are people working? But like, I don't care. I'm in security. Uh, uh, I care if somebody is doing things in production and their keyboard is not uh, being used. That's what freaks me out. So that's one thing we're planning on doing. Uh, and the other is um, also with OS Query, like we keep track of external IP addresses that people are uh, using with their devices. And so I think we can auto close things for certain cases where it's like, oh, this person did this thing, but they came from an IP address that they come from every day, like it's their house or whatever. Um, we might just be able to like auto close those in certain uh, for certain alerts. Any more locations? Uh, we don't use a VPN to access any of our resources. It's all just sort of like cloud-based authentication. So that. That hasn't been an issue. What I will say has been an issue with geolocation is uh, occasionally there is terrible resolution with certain like uh, service providers. And so what you'll see is like you'll get an alert like uh, this person did a login from like this state. And then you go look and it says the uh, resolution is 1,000 kilometers. It's like, well, that's like the US. Like you're anywhere in the US is basically what it said. So that's annoying. Um, and I, I don't have a fix for that quite yet. Might have to use like multiple GIP providers or something like that, but typically it's pretty good. Awesome. Thank you all so much, and thanks, Tynes, for hosting this.